Thank you very much. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, here again, uh, it's a continuation of the previous talk because I'm also going to use a bit uh, of uh, Kubernetes for the auto-scaling. Um, so this uh, presentation was prepared by Tom, who is the developer of, uh, uh, the main developer of Dask ML, and I helped it uh, a bit uh, by working on uh, the interface between Dask and Scikit-learn. And so this is uh, a, a preliminary uh, presentation of what's currently uh, available through uh, Dask ML and what also possible development could have in the future. Uh, so th the motivation uh, is that uh, uh, Python is very good for interactive data analysis and predictive modeling, but problem is that you often hear that it doesn't scale, whatever that means, uh, or it's not production ready. Um, the, so the goal of, uh, of uh, the, the our effort or the work that we make at uh, this moment is to try to uh, make it easier to enable a machine learning on larger data set or on larger problems, like uh, more CPU usage, basically. Uh, so we, we use Dask as the infrastructure for this work, and I'm just going to give you a recap of what is Dask in uh, very shortly. Uh, so Dask is a pure Python high-level API uh, that is very familiar because it builds on, on tools such as NumPy and Pandas, and in some of the cases it actually acts as a drop-in replacement in your source code. Uh, and it makes it possible to work with a very large data set that doesn't fit in memory on a single machine. Uh, um, and even use a, a bunch of uh, cluster, uh, machines on a cluster. And to do that, it's managing basically what we call a, a scheduler that runs tasks, individual chunks of, uh, of uh, function calls uh, in parallel in many threads or many processes or many machines on, on a cluster. So it's more like an orchestrator and high-level Python API that is nice for, for data scientists, basically. So for instance, if you are a Pandas user, uh, you can read Parquet file into a data frame and do some kind of group by operation. Uh, then uh, the group by operation, you do an aggregation, which is a sum on a specific column. And then you will sort the result to extract the top 10 results, uh, the highest, uh, for instance, uh, transaction amount per employer in this case. Uh, here, the difference between uh, a Pandas and Dask data frame is the import statement. The fact that you read several files instead of one in, in the uh, data loading process, and the fact that at the end you have a delayed result. It's not computed yet, it's just a plan on how to compute that operation on a cluster. And then you can comp call compute method on that and you will get back a, a regular pandas data frame in memory on your, on your client program, basically. Um, so and when you do that, what does, does the under the hood? It builds a graph, which is a symbolic description of individual subtasks and how they can be run in parallel, and how they, they can be synchronized to get, the to get to the final result. So the, the results are not computed immediately. You can delay the execution and, and, and send the, the execution over to a cluster. Uh, so the, the Dask scheduler uh, uh, will, will identify parallel sections in that, uh, in that graph of operation, and will run that on parallel resources, CPUs or machines. Uh, so in practice, that can look like this. Uh, for bigger graphs. I think this is a linear algebra operation. I don't remember which one. Uh, you can see that the, 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 green, uh, the red uh, part is something that is being uh, um, computed. It is an intermediate result that stays in memory. And the blue part are intermediate results that are, uh, that are no longer necessary and can be garbage collected. And uh, this graph can be scaled to several machines. So in summary, it's, uh, you write familiar NumPy, Pandas, or Python function calls, and you chain them, and you just wrap them using a, a tiny bit of Dask-specific API, and then you, you will, when you execute that, that generates a graph, and that graph of computation is executed in parallel by the, the Dask scheduler. And in the end, you get some concrete result that you can store on a hard drive or collect back to your, your client uh, application. So Dask ML specifically is trying to build on top of Dask to make it easier to scale machine learning uh, workflow. So uh, uh, Dask ML provides uh, estimators uh, and utilities for machine learning. They build on Dask, and some of them can use uh, Dask-specific data structures like Dask arrays or Dask data frame to handle a data set that doesn't fit in memory. Um, and also uh, they leverage the ability to uh, tap into many CPUs on a cluster for distributed computation when you, your main workload is a bottleneck by the CPU. Uh, 
And so it, it also gives you some flexible task scheduling for sophisticated algorithm if you want to, uh, to be more dynamic. Like if you have iterative algorithms, you have the flexibility not to define the graph ahead of time, but to send some computation, get some back intermediate result, compute if you have converged or not, and reschedule new uh, computation uh, asynchronously uh, if you want. So that can be also useful, for instance, for hyperparameter search. Uh, so uh, there are two different dimensions for scaling uh, machine learning workflow. Uh, one is a CPU bound task and the other one is RAM uh, bound task. So compute uh, scale and, uh, and there is an axis for computation and axis for data basically. So if you use scikit-learn on a single machine, you might be limited either by the kind of the, the model complexity. For instance, if you want to do a big grid search, it might require hours of uh, computation on a CPU, on a single CPU. Uh, or it can also be limited by the amount of RAM of data that you can fit on RAM on a single machine. Because scikit-learn works using uh, NumPy as a primary data structure. So it expects that the, data, uh, the full data set uh, sits in memory for most of the algorithms. So you have this kind of, uh, generally when, uh, when the data set is larger, the computation time is also larger, and so you might also be limited. So this is why you have this kind of triangle. Uh, so first, there is a first solution, which is uh, just if your data is small enough to, to fit in memory on a single node, what you can do is benefit from several machines where you will copy the same data set, the same training set, but run uh, uh, independent models on different machines. For instance, if you do grid search or uh, an ensemble of decision trees at random forest, you can run them in parallel. It's an embarrassingly parallel uh, task. So for this, what you can do is benefit from what we call distributed scikit-learn, which is basically an, integ an integration between uh, the Joblib uh, uh, parallel engine that is built in into scikit-learn to a Dask distributed system. So this is the first integration option. And the second one is to tackle data that doesn't fit on a single node. So the first option is just to subsample it and make it fit on a single node and see if it works, because sometimes it's enough. Uh, if it's not enough, uh, then you can uh, uh, be benefit from out-of-core algorithms using Dask arrays or Dask data frames. Or uh, you can also uh, implement using Dask primitive scalable uh, algorithms or uh, maybe also uh, reuse uh, external libraries like XJBoost and use Dask uh, more as an or orchestrator uh, to make it easy to integrate uh, XGBoost, distributed XGBoost into a, a standard Python pipeline running on a cluster. So I will uh, go into more detail for each of those options. So first, let's focus on CPU-bound operations uh, on, a, on small or medium data set that fits in a couple of uh, gigabytes or tens of gigabytes that fits on a single node. Um, so a traditional way to do that in scikit-learn uh, um, so is, is to plug scikit-learn with, with Dask to, to achieve this. So Dask will provide you the, the, the cluster computing scheduler. Uh, we will load the data in a single NumPy array uh, that fits in memory on each of the workers uh, of the cluster. And scikit-learn will provide the logic, the, the, the mathematics uh, of the scikit-learn estimators. Uh, so uh, the, uh, the, the typical way to do that on a single machine using scikit-learn, for instance, if you want to do a hyperparameter hyper, hyper search uh, on a, using grid search, so this is an embarrassingly parallel task. You define one estimator that you're interested in, a, a grid of possible parameters that you want to explore, and you can tell scikit-learn n jobs equal minus one, which means uh, use uh, as much as possible CPUs as you can to run uh, jobs par uh, in parallel. And uh, when you call fit, the uh, scikit-learn will call it into joblib, and depending on the kind of task that you're doing, it will use uh, either uh, processes or threads to run on parallel on several CPUs, several cores on a single machine. Uh, what we have introduced recently in the, in the last release of joblib is the ability uh, to uh, unplug the default uh, thread-based or process-based parallelism mechanism and to talk to a Dask scheduler to run on a cluster of machines. So to do this, you just have to uh, use this uh, parallel backend context manager here, and, uh, and oops, sorry. And uh, when I switch between those two slides, yeah, <laughs> you just see that there is a, an additional line here uh, that will contextualize this call to, to run uh, uh, using the, the distributed scheduler. And uh, the rest of the code is the same because uh, it's just using, uh, scikit-learn is just using joblib internally, so this is the, the, the connection layer. Uh, 
So I will just show you a, a short demo for this. She is the wrong one. So this is um, uh, a notebook running uh, on a Jupyter cluster. You can see here uh, on a, a Kubernetes cluster, you can see here that we are using the, the Jupyter Hub setup uh, and uh, the Helm configuration from uh, uh, the people at uh, Pangeo. Um, and, and so here we just define a, a small data set that fit on a single node. If I run it. Uh, and uh, we can run uh, using scikit-learn a, a single random forest on, a, on this small data set. It's very quick because the data set is small. But if we want to do parameter search, we can do, run uh, several thousands of possible combinations of hyperparameter, and it's going to be much lo longer. So here I'm using random search CV for one iteration. You see, because we do five-fold cross-validation, it's uh, already significantly longer, just one second for one parameter. But if you want to explore many of them, that can be thousands of seconds, so you will have to wait a, m a much longer time. So what we can do instead is configure Dask to talk to uh, uh, the Kubernetes cluster to add additional workers. And uh, when we do this, uh, you can see in the bottom right corner that we have automatically in Kubernetes new workers that have been connected to, uh, to our session, in Jupyter session. We can connect to the scheduler uh, using uh, the Dask API, and we tell Joblib to run on, on the cluster, and dynamically, as uh, Joblib is, is dispatching work, you can see that Dask is talking to Kubernetes to allocate even more compute resources to, to scale and do the, the work as quickly as possible. Um, and uh, finally, once this is complete, it should be quite, quite fast now because uh, we have a ton of uh, CPUs uh, that have been allocated. You can load the results of the grid search into the Pandas data frame and explore that, uh, for instance, here the hyperparameters that were the best is, uh, do not limit the, the depth size of the decision tree, uh, do not limit the min sample leaves, uh, use as many uh, trees in the forest as much as possible, and, uh, and so on. And as soon as you stop, all, all the, uh, as soon as you restart your, your, your kernel, all, all the resources are, are, are released. So you don't waste uh, resources on the cluster if you don't need them, even if you're doing interactive uh, data analysis like this. So the second uh, kind of uh, scaling uh, axis that we can use is how to scale to larger uh, volumes of data. Uh, data that doesn't fit on a single machine, on a single node in the cluster. Uh, first, do you need to do that? Because sometimes if you just subsample your data, uh, like you turn 10% and then 20%, you fit two models twice using cross-validation, and you will see that the, uh, the increase in accuracy might be very, very slow, so uh, maybe, uh, very low. So maybe it's completely useless to waste the compute resources of a cluster if, you're, if you don't have the right data. Uh, so do this kind of sanity check uh, first using a, a learning curve in, in scikit-learn. It's very easy to do. Uh, secondly, uh, do you need all the data for training? Sometimes uh, uh, only the inference is very uh, um, um, costly because uh, you might have a limited amount of training data with labels and a large amount of uh, unlabeled data that you need to classify, for instance, to detect special events in uh, astronomy uh, uh, images. Uh, and so what you actually need to scale in that case is the predict function, the, the, the inference uh, step. In that case, uh, it's very embarrassingly parallel, and DaskML provides a, an easy way to wrap any scikit-learn estimator to parallelize the, the predict function. Uh, but if you really need to do distributed training, uh, you have two options. Either you wrap one of the scikit-learn models that, that support partial fit method, the incremental learning, and DaskML provides you with a higher level API that wraps the scikit-learn uh, model so that it can run on a Dask uh, array distributed on the cluster, in the memory on the cluster. Uh, even if the model is sequential, uh, it, it makes it possible to, uh, to, to scale to out-of-core computation this way. Uh, and secondly, also DaskML is, is, is re-implementing more and more so, some estimators to directly internally benefit from the Dask uh, parallelism mechanism. Uh, but this sometimes requires to rework the algorithm because we can no longer uh, make the assumption that everything in, is in memory on a single node. So uh, to use the, the first strategy, which is just, just to wrap a scikit-learn model that has a partial fit uh, method uh, for incremental learning, 
Uh, each estimator is go going to train uh, on a block mini batch of data at a time and then can release it and the model, will be the model parameter will be incrementally uh, updated this way. Uh, so dust collections uh, are already blocked. There is already an uh, uh, underlying chunked uh, NumPy array data structure that is the, the back end of a dust array. So we can plug those two concepts together very naturally. So here is the code if you want to use scikit-learn on a single machine to do the uh, out-of-core loop manually. You can define a Python uh, object which is a data stream that is just an, an iterator of uh, NumPy arrays. So you have to write it yourself in this case. And here you instantiate the class with the model parameter. But, and, and then you can call partial fit in the loop and uh, for each chunk of data you increment the, the state of the model until you've seen all your data and uh, you, uh, uh, as, as you go you, uh, the garbage collector of Python will uh, release the, the, the past uh, chunks of data that are no, no longer necessary. Uh, so instead of doing this loop manually, what you can do is plug uh, um, the scikit-learn estimator into the incremental uh, meta estimator of DaskML and then uh, you just call fit as you would do naturally, but here x big and y big are actually dask arrays that do not fit on a single node, but uh, might be partitioned uh, in the memory of several nodes uh, on a cluster or even on disk if it doesn't fit in memory. So I have also a demo for that. Um, so let's switch here. So, too quickly. So here again, uh, we start, uh, uh, we connect our Jupyter session uh, to, uh, it's running on Kubernetes and we already co connected to the uh, DAS Kubernetes uh, component. So you, we have a session that talks to uh, uh, a fixed amount of workers in, in this, in this uh, uh, case. So we have 12 workers and each has two threads. And you, you see that the, the different workers have a, a each of them has a, a bunch of a gigabyte of RAM. So in aggregate, we have 72 gigabyte of RAM for, on the cluster. So it's uh, assumed that it's larger than each uh, individual node. Uh, so here, we are going to use Dask to generate a fake uh, classification problem uh, with the, uh, the size that we want. And so we are going to uh, allocate in memory its uh, random, uh, random classification data with some structure between X and Y. So it's, it looks like the scikit-learn data set make classification utility function to just benchmark your algorithm. This is the same, but this time it's going to allocate that on the worker nodes in parallel. And uh, in total, we will use uh, 32 gigabytes uh, of RAM on the cluster, but on the different nodes, partitioned over the, the different nodes. So here on the right-hand side, you see the diagnostic page, and you see that it's doing the random uh, generation of the data in parallel. Uh, it can saturate completely the CPU on the cluster, and you can see also the aggregate memory usage of the cluster. We now have 32 gigabytes of RAM allocated in memory uh, persisted in the, on the cluster. So if I come back here, I define my HDD classifier, which has a partial fit method. Uh, I import the incremental wrapper from DaskML. I wrap my scikit-learn estimator in the incremental wrapper. And then I can uh, introspect from the target class, uh, or from the target variable, how many classes are there in this data set. And I pass that as an argument also with the X and Y, which are the distributed arrays that live in, in memory on the cluster. Uh, to, to be able uh, to uh, do the incremental computation. And here, this is quite in interesting because here the, the code is really, really sequential. Like uh, uh, stochastic gradient descent uh, will do one step at a time. So in, on the diagnostic page, you can see the, the graph of tasks and the dependencies. And you see live uh, the, the red dot moving around, which is basically the, the partial field call that is being chained over the different chunks. If I go back to the task view, you can see that one worker is doing one thing at a time and the other worker is doing nothing. But basically here what's happening is that the, the model is moving around between the worker because the model is quite small and the data has been partitioned previously. So it's the model that is jumping from one node to the next. And sometimes there are data transfers in red here because uh, the Y chunk and the X chunk might not have been allocated on the same node initially. Uh, but you see that very quickly uh, they, they are uh, collected uh, together and uh, everything happens uh, very efficiently. So here at the b beginning, we can saturate on the profiler view. This is the profiler view that is built in, task, in Dask. 
Uh, at the beginning, we can saturate all the CPUs of, of the cluster because uh, here this is the generation of the random data that is able to do that in parallel. Uh, we can actually, actually see this is the function apply random from, uh, from Dask that is being run. And, uh, and there, after, in the, in the end, uh, you see that there are a very few, uh, just a tiny fraction of the CPUs of, of the cluster that are running, but uh, one after the other. And if you look at the, the profiling view, this is actually the feed binary uh, method from scikit-learn and input validation for each of the chunks from scikit-learn that have been wrapped and, and run uh, sequentially on, on the cluster node. If, you, if I stop here my kernel, what is really interesting in, in this view here is that you can see that all the nodes, the Kubernetes nodes, the pods are being terminated and garbage collected. So you release the resources for other data scientists running on the same cluster. You, are, you completely release the data and, uh, and make those resources available to other users. So I'll switch it back to the slide quickly. Um, so there are also a, a bunch of uh, distributed estimators that have been uh, uh, re re refactored basically uh, to, to work with Dask primitive under the hood in the fit method. So, uh, so typical uh, use cases are, uh, for instance, generalized linear models. For instance, there is logistic regression and linear regression that have that are using um, um, Dask-optimized uh, uh, parallel algorithms like ADMM and LBFGS that are able to uh, fully saturate uh, CPUs on the cluster. But be careful because sometimes, depending on the data shape and data structure, sometimes a sequential algorithm like uh, Saga might converge much faster that a, than a distributed algorithm that will use a lot more energy and CPU. So, uh, please stay smart if you can uh, to choose the, the right algorithm uh, and, and save, uh, avoid wasting energy for nothing. Um, uh, but there is also uh, distributed algorithms like uh, k-means that has a specific uh, uh, initialization scheme that can run in parallel. This is the k-means parallel uh, replacement for k-means plus plus. And basically this is a strategy that is also Im implemented in, in Spark. I'm not sure it's, if it's the best or not, but uh, we haven't run full, uh, full benchmark, but uh, at least it, it can run in parallel. And there are also standard preprocessing stuff, uh, like a quantile transformer, standard scalar, robust scalar, um, that, that can naturally be uh, uh, embarrassingly parallel and work on a Dask array, uh, if, even if the data doesn't fit in memory. And there are also uh, more compute intensive steps like uh, PCA, uh, linear algebra operation like SVD that have been re-implemented using a randomized uh, uh, SVD to run uh, distributed on a cluster. And this was also built in, in a Dask Linalg uh, uh, submodule and wrapped as a, as a Dask ML estimator. And finally, there is also a wrapper for XGBoost to run in distributed mode. I don't know if you have tried, but uh, XGBoost, uh, you can set it up to run on a cluster, but it's very painful to configure uh, all the nodes, all the workers to talk to one another, and then to call it from P Python. It can be quite complicated. And so uh, Dask ML has also a high-level wrapper where you'd say, I just want to run that on my Dask cluster, and it will automatically start the, the XGBoost uh, worker. And so it's a very efficient way to do a... Uh, uh, large-scale uh, gradient boosted trees. So I think uh, I will end here and I just have a couple of notes on cluster deployment. So if there is a question on that, uh, we can talk a bit about that. Uh, but uh, I'm, I'm ready to take some questions. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. We have time for a couple of questions. Um, there's the mic, standing mic there. And I have this mic I can try to jog to you if you have questions. And I forgot to say this last time, but please ask only one question in the form of a question, just as a reminder. Any questions? Thank you for the excellent talk. Um, I have a quick point of confusion. At what point does the, um, does the FIT method know which client to use? It, to submit to a Dask scheduler. I didn't notice anywhere in there. Uh, at which point does the? Um, so earlier in the slides, um, you introduced, I think it was, if you keep going back, it's the first time you actually used the distributed scheduler, yes. Yes, okay. Um, I see you use parallel backend Dask, but what mm -hmm. if you have like multiple client objects in your session and multiple clusters? How does it know which one to use? Um, actually, uh, uh, 
Yeah, maybe here uh, uh, this code uh, is, would not actually run. I think we initially we uh, need to uh, create a client first. And uh, basically, when you create a client, the first time is going to be used uh, the, as the default client. And if you want to plug some specific client, you can also pass it as an argument to parallel backend uh, uh, Dask here. Ah, okay, uh, cool. But uh, if you create one, it's going to reuse the, the, the existing one. In general, you just need one per process. Okay, cool. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, thank you for the great talk. Um, just curious on general, uh, very broad comparisons with Spark and with H2O, because mm -hmm. they both have distributed ML, just um, in terms of maturity or uh, algorithm parity, that sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, so I think um, uh, from a matur maturity point of view, you can see that the, right now in DaskML, the, we don't have uh, the full scikit-learn uh, uh, zoo uh, available. There is just a, a tiny fraction of them that are available in fully distributed mode. And I think in H2O and its Spark, they directly implemented algorithms to be scalable. So they only focused on uh, uh, the subset of, of uh, algorithms that they know are very useful to run at scale like uh, gradient boosted trees, uh, random forest, and things like that, uh, and uh, out of core at the same time. Um, so here we are playing a bit catch up <laughs> with those. But at the same time, if you also benefit from the full scikit-learn uh, models, even those that are not scalable, they might be important at some point in your, in your pipeline. Uh, so I think it's a different trade-off, and uh, over time, uh, hopefully, we will catch up and we will have more and more distributed algorithms directly in DaskML. Thank you. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. If you have a questions on deployment, we'll see. <laughs> Uh, okay, so I, I noticed that uh, the the stochastic gradient descent was actually being run in serial. So uh, in gradient descent, what you do is you take a mean right somewhere, and and can't that mean be parallelized? Like, does it have to be serial? Uh, that mean can be run over multiple machines, so it can be CPU optimized. Mm -hmm. um. So the problem is here that uh, uh, when we do this SGD for a linear model, uh, there is very few uh, amount of computation per uh, chunk of data to transfer between the RAM and the CPU. So we are, you are RAM bottleneck most of the time. So even if we were able to parallelize the compute intensive part of a linear model, uh, that would be kind of limited in the case of SGD for a linear model. If you run this SGD for a non-linear model like a, a deep convolutional neural net, then just doing the forward pass uh, is, is, uh, takes some time. And uh, so you can cut your mini batch in smaller mini batches and run that on several GPUs and uh, at the end synchronize uh, the, the gradient computation. And in that case, that makes sense to parallelize up to some point. Uh, typically, uh, I think uh, it's quite easy to parallelize uh, SGD for um, a convolutional neural net with tens to hundreds of GPUs. Beyond that point, uh, uh, it's uh, really hard. It's an uh, open uh, area of research. OK, I understand. Thank you. Go ahead. I am truly interested in uh, talking a little more about deployment. So uh, you were going to mention that in the next slides. <laughs> Uh, okay, so the, de the deployment. Uh, so uh, in, in this uh, demo, I uh, presented uh, uh, a small test cluster that is based on the configuration uh, that was uh, developed for the Pangeo project, a geoscience platform uh, for scalable analysis using uh, Dask and Jupyter Hub and uh, X-Array. Um, and so uh, we are using this Dask Kubernetes uh, connector that has the ability to do adaptive uh, scheduling and, uh, and deployment of additional pods based on the, on, the, on the queue in the Dask scheduler. It's also possible to, to run that, the same kind of operation on a traditional academic HPC cluster, for instance, running a Slurm or PBS or SGE. And there is, it's a currently under development, but there is also this kind of uh, uh, adaptive uh, provisioning of additional workers uh, live that is being added to this uh, integration. And finally, there is also the, the possibility to run on a Hadoop cluster, and so basically use the Yarn application manager to, uh, to schedule workers uh, also on a Hadoop cluster. I think right now it's static, so you have to say the number of workers that you want, but in the future it's going to be dynamic as well. 
And uh, so the adaptive scaling, I think, is very important because uh, when you do uh, interactive exploration using uh, uh, Jupyter Hub, for instance, most of the time you're writing code or uh, doing a plot of the result, and during that time you actually don't need the resources, so you can release that. And as soon as you uh, launch a compute-intensive uh, step that is parallelizable, it would dynamically reprovision uh, most of the resource of the cluster that is available to, to run that as quickly as possible, to reduce the latency of your analysis, get some results, release back the, the resources so that other data scientists can run on the same cluster. Even if, you're, if your workload is not very parallel, it makes it possible to share a cluster with different users uh, without having them to run out of memory uh, because you know exactly how much memory you have in, in your workers. So, All right, thank you. If you have any other questions, you can talk to Olivier outside. Thanks. Thank you very much.